Uh, welcome everybody to the Hyde 21-22 lecture series. My name is Jason Griffiths, Associate Professor in the Architecture Department. And our lecture series this academic year is called Post-Pandemic Futures. Uh, Post-pandemic, uh, perhaps we were a little hasty. Are we really, really there yet? But regardless, why not take this opportunity and why not consider what might emerge what is emerging, particularly in the realm of equality and planning and design. This series is our gathering point for disciplinary thought. It is the confluence of landscape architecture, uh, interior design and community and regional planning, planning, along with the voices of the AIS. I represent them as their chair, and together we have come up with a description that provides us with a chance to consider the COVID pandemic and it has changed what we do, how we work, the spaces that we occupy, and the new distances that we have, particularly between, between loved ones. Moreover, what it has brought to our attention is the dormant social inequities that we have known for years and yet somehow neglected. How do we respond? And how do we mobilize, uh, mobilize ourselves as practitioners and educators? Everything must be considered from the macro architecture of the handheld device to the macro of the global communities. What new methodologies do we adopt? Blockchain materialism, rapid prototyping, guerrilla gardening, and the role of real-time geolocational data analysis. How do we work in new patterns of collaboration with medical professionals, policymakers, and social activists? We are fortunate in this lecture series to draw upon the insights of others to explore what planners and de designers can offer in the way of solutions to the post-pandemic future. As a transdisciplinary committee, we like to initiate our series with a lecturer who generates enthusiasm on all fronts. The enthusiasm for Jason Bruges' work is truly transdisciplinary. Much of what we see in his work is an intuitive sense of space that if not foreseeing a pandemic, certainly predicted the need to intervene in the world beyond the kind of constraints that the pandemic has produced. Recogn recognition of his work in this realm uh, comes through innovative installations and innovations that are both groundbreaking and truly international. His material is often light, sculpted through the interactive spaces and the surfaces that surround us. Spaces that sit between the world of architecture and the site-specific installation and interaction design. What has impressed so many is his ability to move seamlessly between architecture and these other worlds. What impresses is his adeptness with high -tech, uh, high, the high-tech media um, that explore the spectacle and the time-based interventions and dynamic spatial experiences. He is passionate about creating this work in a site-specific manner that engages these users with their environments. So Jason was born in 1972, and uh, so his parents were also truly innovative when it came to, to, came to first names, of course. Pause for that one. I was born in 64, but I'll leave that. He studied his training at Oxford Brookes University, and then he went to the Bartlett, where I was fortunate to see his earliest installations and playful interactions within the liminar liminality of experimental education. The school was run by the then Sir Peter Cook, who often saw phenomena as the way to expand the limits of architecture beyond its conventional inert materiality. Via this route, Jason Bruce has come to us and comes to us from a shed on top of a building in nighttime London. I think it's difficult to explain um, but the shed uh, within the UK is a kind of an iconic space of the English inventor, and that's exactly what he is. Uh, and he represents this as a, the a point with the long line of his forebearers. From the imaginings of Heath Robinson, uh, the ruminations of Paul Virilio, Archigram, Gordon Pax, Gordon Fraser, right the way up to the seminal uh, Unit 16, I think it was, with Stephen Gage. Am I correct, Jason? 16. I beg your pardon. Um, and he now teaches as a visiting professor at the Bartlett, the Royal College, and I think at BCU as well. 
His work carries forward the influence of these forebearers uh, in the form of a kind of an electronic flickering flame that's fired by a fascination of the ethereal and ephemeral world of light, sound, and vision. So I'm absolutely happy at this point to be able to introduce Jason Bruges to kick off our Hyde lecture series. Please be aware, of course, that you can um, post questions in the chat and I will moderate those questions in whatever session at the, at the end of the lecture. At this point, I want to hand over and warmly welcome Jason Bruges. Thank you. Jason, thank you very much for that fantastic introduction and I'm very honored to be um, giving this lecture this afternoon, um, but although it's e late evening in London. And um, yeah, I'm gonna spend a bit of time really um, taking on a journey through um, the development of my work and practice and show you some of the work we're currently undertaking within the studio. So the practice, um, we're, we're, we're kind of commissioned very fortunately to create um, interventions, um, artworks for public consumption. Um, this is a, a good example of a piece um, at the Victorian Albert Museum in Kensington, South Kensington in London, a piece commissioned for the Decode exhibition, which was about digital design, digital fabrication, digital craft uh, in 2009. But in terms of the, the sort of work, the experiments I create um, equally, um, I get kind of design briefs to sort of also think about spaces and challenge spaces as well. This is a reveal space for Aston Martin in Warwickshire. So where does this work take place? So I have a studio in and a lab in East London in an area called London Fields. And just so you can picture the environment, there'll be no one there now, but uh, my studio, um, we have a lab, we have a making space, um, and I have a sort of multidisciplinary team. Um, the drone flying through the studio is um, going over the shoulders and heads of scientists, engineers, architects, coders, interaction designers, design engineers, um, amongst others. And my team of like just over 30 people collaborate on mixed disciplinary projects that are largely site specific and largely permanent and very um, fortunate to be commissioned in over 23 countries. And you can sort of see there are a lot of commissions um, within North America and currently working on yeah, several pieces, um, which will be um, op opening um, later this year and early next year in the US. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But the work's site specific. I respond to different sorts of environments um, and different cultures and different loca locations. So the themes that kind of follow through the work, um, looking at natural systems, sort of visualizing the invisible, visualizing um, data mining, um, and, and kind of borrowing from our environment and whether it's a natural system or the kind of movement of people or the aggregation of data. Um, I tell stories with these interventions, um, but all of this work comes to life through prototyping and experimentation. So currently, in the studio, this is a piece we're experimenting with at the moment. We're using um, water as a kind of lens, as, an, as a, uh, an environmental effector. And we're creating these giant water lenses for um, an exhibition in Dubai for the Museum of the Future. And we're looking at water as a medium to choreograph space. So this is actually a film of an experiment that we've been running in the studio over the last couple of months. And so looking at sort of natural systems, so looking at the properties of water and light and how they can control space. 
this gives you a little insight really into the type of types of experiments we're correctly conducting in the studio on a daily basis. And everything we do is prototyped and tested. The work is not complete without its audience. So when I was studying at the Bartlett, um, we started to look at cybernetics. We started to look at um, the re reactions and interactions of people and their environment. And this is a small piece commissioned by the World Wildlife Fund, where we just map the environment using a thermal camera and feed the motion of the people through that environment into this um, matrix of fiberglass um, pandas, which were money collecting boxes. And they track the movement of one person around that space. So wherever you stand, um, they will be looking at you. And this is a sort of reoccurring theme using sort of space syntax, the movement of people in space artistically to drive the work and look at kind of essentially live real-time heat maps sort of to drive the choreography and the animation of work. This is a sketch for a project. Um, this is a tunnel um, in a street called Beat Street that runs underneath the Barbican Art Centre in the centre of London. And we were commissioned by the city to create an intervention. And we're using data from people's movements and interactions um, across the social media sphere to actually create patterns within this uh, intervention called Brutalist Tapestry. Um, and this, was, this is just a visualization to explore what this looked like. These machines run along the tunnel, creating these um, textures that are like a kind of tapestry that are inspired by the Brutalist architecture of the bar Barbican itself. So data is a key component. Storytelling is also really important and narratives bringing our built environment to life. This is an artwork in a children's hospital um, called Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, where the walls come to life. As you, as the children go to surgery through, through the hospital, um, from wall to theatre, the wallpaper comes to life and these animals um, kind of are watching you and, and it's all about kind of distraction really as you go on your way to theatre. And as I said, it's lots of experimentation. So this is an experiment looking at actually floating electronic displays on water and running electrical currents through that water to create uh, a kind of circuit, creating these sort of um, almost like a kind of water lilies. And as I said, the projects are very much hands on and they're kind of built by my team um, working together. This was a um, project where we were creating um, a kind of intervention, uh, a series of follies which were filmed actually to create some uh, branding for one of our TV channels. And this is sort of a little glimpse into the studio where we're creating these electromechanical devices that can change colour based on how the motors turn the cassettes within them. We applied these to trees, boats, You can see the, out, the effect created by these. So before I go much further, I thought I'd dig out some projects that um, we've been commissioned to create in North America. So from um, early work like Visual Echo in the Architecture Centre in New York, 
um, through to Vector Field, which we've been recently commissioned, which is a, a media artwork um, at Dallas Love Field, which uses a sort of a generated algorithm to create um, sort of clouds of light above people, above the moving walkways, through to um, Back to Front in Toronto, um, which I'll talk more about later, Liquid Crystal in San Antonio, Piston Effect in Toronto, and um, I'll talk a little bit about Game Show in Oregon, uh, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and I was commissioned by the Oregon Arts Commission in 2010 to create this piece of work at the end campus end of the Matthew Knight Arena. And as you probably all know, the um, Oregon Ducks um, obviously take their colouring from the kind of mallard duck and its sort of signal yellow bill and its sort of iridescent green head plumage. And so the artwork was inspired by that coloration. And we were looking at sort of essentially mapping the movement of the sports men and women um, inside the arena and mapping it onto this artwork and started exploring and playing with a material called liquid crystal um, to sort of generate uh, a, a kind of directional canvas. Um, so as there is movement on, on the, within the court, um, the artwork comes to life. So this is um, live still in Eugene and was uh, finished and completed in 2010, 11 years ago. So this was the first um, piece of work I created in a public space in uh, the US. And this is a sort of classic piece of um, digital placemaking. This is at the entrance to the Olympic Park in London. And it's called Digital Fountain. Um, and it was commissioned to bring to life that environment and it celebrates the kind of the riverine history of um, the, the Lee Valley in East London. You have a river and you have a canal um, and thinking about how water features um, animate space. And this piece is a generative, it's all ever changing. And the material is a liquid crystal, it reflects light. So the sort of changing blues are coming um, from an algorithm that is based on a physics system. And in order to sort of be inspired in this process, um, actually create a, a, a real life fountain which was scanned in, in my studio. This is the view from the top of the CN Tower and this was the inspiration for an artwork in Toronto. And I was really fascinated the way that that Toronto has this sort of wonderful cityscape, which is really dominated by shadows. Um, and on the time of day, the, the kind of environments drastically change and low rise London doesn't really change in the same kind of way. And I wondered if there's, I could create something that was choreographed by the shadows, create an artwork where, um, and this was a sort of sketch of a, a kind of artist's impression for this piece. So we developed, these canvases, which were sensitive to light. And here's an insight into the kind of in the studio where we're testing um, light levels changing on one of these canvases. Each pixel is light sensitive. So it, it's like having lots and lots of cameras across this surface. That's that close up. Um, all of the projects within the studio are design and build. So we're commissioned like artists, but then actually do deliver the work. So it's sort of built and tested by the studio and we create complete um, documents that describe how these artworks will go together. And here you can see a sketch just showing how um, we were gonna create a prototype. And this was a prototype created for testing. So because this artwork was gonna go into an environment we knew it was gonna be quite harsh, with huge temperature swings, trip swings that the, 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 the kind of the joints and the um, way that the artwork would go together would be really tested. So this was um, actually tested in a temperature chamber. Water jet cut. And here you can sort of see the surface of the artwork and it essentially records everything it sees around it. So any shadow that's cast on the artwork is displayed and played back in real time. And here you can sort of see 
how that comes to life. And basically at night, if you cast a shadow, it creates this sort of playful kind of silhouette that brings it to life. And you can sort of see it works in the day as well. And I've been exploring, working with, this is a piece of work that works in the same sort of way. Um, and this, this piece of work uh, uses actually um, an infrared shadow to um, actually um, respond to the environment. And people um, interact with this work in lots of ways. I mean, it's sort of a very kind of playful piece. And this, this actually sits under the raw route that goes into Wembley Stadium. And uh, um, you can sort of see it, it's sort of a living piece of work. So another piece of work that um, tracks movement is uh, this piece of work in Beijing called Diacritic Mirage, which is in a Norman Foster building um, in just next to the fifth ring road, south, southeast side of Beijing. And this piece of work tracks the movement of people through space and creates a living painting. So the person is like a paintbrush and it uses a system called optical flow, which is essentially analyzing the environment and sort of essentially creating um, a painting on the wall. And we use a network of diacritic prisms and white light to generate a kind of a digital painting that's inspired by the way that Chinese culture uses plum blossom trees. So this is sort of bifurcating and sort of representing growth and movement. And this is all driven by the movement of people through that space. It's a permanent piece of work. There's a white um, white matrix of light that hits hits these prisms. Actually zo zooming in close to these prisms, you can sort of see the the prism itself and it generates green and magenta light to sort of represent um, parts um, of the tree. And the, the sort of tree was envisaged with these sketches. So looking at how the light would branch across this surface and the sorts of tests that we kind of created within the studio to sort of experiment, um, you can sort of see some of the experiments that are happening to look at how the effects could be created. Another piece that um, references the natural world, and this is, um, I've not actually seen in person. So the kind of quite interesting thing at the moment, working across the world with the pandemic is creating site specific work in places you're not seeing. So working remotely. And this commission is in a building in the south of Seoul in South Korea. And the commission was to create an artwork to welcome people into the building. And you got on an escalator into the building and it's an eight story high atrium with this kind of 16 meter, um, 50 foot diameter oculus, which you go through. And I was thinking about an artwork that you could travel through that has like a kind of split level and creating essentially a representation of a sort of digital tree canvas. So this is, we've got 40 wires strung across this oculus holding four and a half thousand facets of liquid crystal and edge lip polymers that re represent the kind of quality of a tree. And you can sort of see the view from above. And the materials work a bit like this. So you've got kind of liquid crystal shutters working alongside these edge lit polymers. And you can sort of see how you get these overlapping materials to create the effect of being like in this tree. And because we're not able to actually travel to Seoul, we, we built a digital twinner a representation of this piece in unity. 
So the, the games engine that allows us to sort of actually preview how it would be choreographed and how it would be brought to life. Here's, here's, here's the kind of view from underneath that piece of work. This uh, work called Variegation Index um, is in a lobby of a building um, in central London. Um, client is British land and, and they had an idea, it's an existing building of bringing a communal garden into an office block. So where the community could actually grow plants in, in the same way um, that we have kind of gardens called allotments where communities will grow food. And I thought it'd be quite interesting to see if we can create a, a work that would actually respond to the plants in real time. So we started working with a system called um, that, that farmers use to assess um, that farmers use to assess how well plants are growing. So um, and it's called MVDI, and it looks at the absorbed and reflected infrared. So this is actually an experiment in the studio where we're using these cameras to look at plants. You can sort of tell how well a, a plant is photosynthesizing. So this artwork is driven and choreographed by the kind of health of the plants in the space. So we actually created our own cameras to film the absorbed and reflected infrared and that information is streamed to the artwork. So the plants are like the choreographers, they're the conductors for the artwork. This is a dual aspect artwork from one, one angle you see sort of modulated light and the other angle you actually kind of see data sets um, playing back through the artwork. Now, this project has led to actually a new collaboration. We're working with Colorado State University at the moment on a commission for a media artwork on a pedestrian bridge linking two bu buildings in their new spur campus. And we're essentially looking at live experiments that are taking place. So there's a lot of agri-tech and um, experiments with um, photobiology and also um, looking at other sort of types of um, growth chambers and green roofs and things. We're logging data from those plant environments to drive um, the media artwork that we have on the bridge. And, and here are just some of the sketches of the work in progress. And we are emulating how that work responds in real time to the plant. So um, a lot of the work will is driven by the research and development happening in the studio. And we have a kind of stream, ongoing stream of research and development where we might be looking at certain sorts of phenomena or, or effects. Um, and this is a project where we were looking at moving headlamps as, as a way of controlling space. So we're using um, a connect, I think, here um, to drive an environment um, that's changing in response to my movement. So this is some research that we're taking place, sort of creating these sort of ephemeral architectures from um, light. And this is we were asked to create an intervention in York Midster, which is a large um, medieval cathedral in Yorkshire, in, in the city of York. And this is an intervention that um, was temporary. And hopefully you can hear the organ soundtrack. And this was a sort of temporary intervention, immersive piece, which kind of celebrated the types of volumes you might get in this type of space. And the, in order for these moving head luminaires to pick up on that environment, the the volume of space is is misted so you can sort of get these moving moving heads generating this uh, volume of light that's ever changing and the organist played live alongside our installation to create this sort of um intervention.
and you can sort of see this piece is quite interesting to show sort of how the work was developed so the movement and the volumes we're creating in this space are have been pre-visualized and created within a, um, a software system that allows us to sort of look at this and you can sort of see this is us experimenting with this effect and building test rigs in the studio So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of doing some sort of major um, sort of transformations of cities. And I was commissioned in um, 2017 to look at Hull, which is in Yorkshire as well. And this is it in its medieval state with a kind of wall around it. Um, and we were asked to bring to transform the sort of medieval city of Hull and this um, shows us looking at a series of sites and the idea was for transformation using media and light and we were sort of interested there's a lot of history of developing maritime infrastructure signaling systems and ways of talking um, from the city to the um, incoming ships so rather than using humans we started to explore the idea um, of actually using robots to move signals around the city to create a kind of performance and here you can see some of the sort of sketches we created to explore how this might work and what we started doing was sketching the idea of having these kind of handshakes where light was passed around the city and here you can see the idea of um, using industrial robot arms moving light using lenses and mirrors so to develop the project, we realized we'd actually have to go um, looking for um, repurposed, upcycled um, automotive um, robot arms. So these are some arms in the uh, Jaguar Land Rover factory in Solihull, which we repurposed. And this is us in our workshop starting to sort of test um, to starting to test this work, you can see us starting to look at um, lenses and mirrors on the end effectors and, and passing light from one robot to the next. What's interesting about these machines, they're quite old. So, I mean, at this point, um, the we were having to recalibrate the controllers. The controllers had very small amount of RAM. So talking to them, but um, because it's an intervention in a medieval context we had to do um sketches for the for the planners for the kind of listing of the project so these are the sketches we created and we developed a way of pre-visualizing how the robots would look as they moved and you can sort of see the environment we created to look at those movements and test them beforehand So quite an unusual project, um, robotics at this scale in public realm um, has not been not been uh, deployed at this scale. So we had to sort of test quite a lot of um, codes and laws really in terms of public safety and public expectations. So every move had to be signed off by an engineer. And we had, these robots were quite large and if, if um, we could obviously make sure that we designed um, the project in a way which would be safe. And here is a view. This project was called Where Do We Go From Here? And that was the name given to it by the creative director for the festival. The, they're, they're kind of moving um, light and sound around these spaces, transforming them and creating a sort of non-linear performance beaming sound and light around the environment there. We had 25 of these ABB 
um, automotive robots animating the environment. This is outside Hullminster, another cathedral. Um, so a sort of medieval environment, but with this sort of intervention that's of the 21st century. And it's surprising how people responded to this. Um, very intrigued and it was um, like an outdoor art gallery, essentially. This is another intervention a bit more like theatre in the round, so you can walk around this one. A performance in the cultural quarter. And what's <laughs> becoming more and more interesting as we work with these machines is in the context of a factory or a manufacturing context, these machines don't generally work so closely together um, or you design robots called cobots, which um, will, will work together. So definitely developing them to work together was one of the challenges. And after working in Hull, we were, um, we saw an opportunity in Tokyo to work on some artworks against the backdrop of the Olympic Games. So in Feb uh, April 2019, 2018, sorry, this is the sketch we created um, for an artwork in downtown Tokyo, a dry landscape, a Zen garden crafted by industrial robots. And it was an idea really to celebrate the highlights of the Olympics, use Olympic data to choreograph and, and give the robots instructions and create a kind of generative landscape. We're scavenging data from video sources. So using background subtraction and pose estimation to create movements and instructions for the robots. You can see some of the early experiments we were doing um, we tested in the studio, we tested different aggregates, we tested different colours, we just tested sort of shadow and light play. You can see some of the visualisations we were creating. And <coughs> Excuse me. We, because of the pandemic, we had to create a one-to-one -one prototype in the UK because we couldn't travel to Japan. So this, the site for this project was in Ueno Park. Um, which is in downtown Toronto. So this, this is a prototype set up in Yorkshire. Four robot arms continu continuously gardening the um, landscape for us using um, a stream of data. And I'll play a short film which sort of shows this piece of work. It launched at the beginning of the Olympics and it has just um, shut down in Tokyo um, and using live data on a daily basis to create these performances, these, these kind of um, studies of the athletes' movements.
That's in your anal part. Now, I'm wondering, I've got plenty more things to share and tell you about, but um, Jason, I was wondering whether we answer some of the questions I could sort of actually probably share some things whilst I'm doing that. We can have a Ab conversation. Absolutely. Um, thank you for, thank you for, yeah. Um, this, I have to say something slightly mesmeric about your work, so I'm just snapping out of it and I'm going to focus on the questions. <laughs> You caught me on the hop there. I was, I was in a. I thought as we're forty minutes in, and I thought we can have a bit of a conversation, a bit of discourse, and I can see questions popping yeah. up. Yeah, I, I also appreciate, uh, you know, how how difficult this is without kind of an audience in front of you. Um, so I think it's a great idea. Um, uh, there's one question that came across, which I, which I also thought uh, other people would relate to, and that's the the. Um, is the question is this is that is uh, are there always digital twins in your <coughs> in your projects or is that becoming increasingly a part of what you do well i have to say i'm gonna let this lay out um so a lot of the a lot of the projects um we we're well obviously at the moment because we can't see work as we're generating it and producing it quite often if it's somewhere else having a digital twin to look at closer to home um is quite important and i mean it will start very early on like this project actually in uh, a visitor center in the Wadden sea thinking about the project digitally building um a sort of physical form for it in the computer that you can walk around and look at but then we can start feeding data into so we're using cinema 4d there um to sort of structure the work but then we're using various environments to then put data into that model and bring it to life so um you'll see in a minute we start sort of feeding movement through that sculpture digitally and this this um enables us to um so this is a flock of birds but uh, we start to push particles or um, movement through that sculpture and we can essentially push that same movement identically through the real thing so the our model becomes the instructions for the real environment so we're building environments that are the you know not only are the the, the drawings which we fabricate from they're also the code and the kind of instructions for something coming to life so just a very um fluid workflow but in, in in times of working in very strange ways we're able also obviously to put on a headset and try putting different data into the different worlds and see seeing what it looks like so yes more and more we're using a sort of a digital twin or a, a kind of a model or a representation that is um very 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 some well it is the same to all intents and purposes as as the sort of final realizations apart from um, not being realized physically yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the what comes across, I think, in, in so many different ways is the sense that which you're only able to work if you have something influencing you. And what influences you is something that exists within the non-digital world and pulls it in and, and then you humanize it through the digital process. So um, so another uh, another question also which came up is, um, you know, about the nature of your studio. Um, and I think it's worth um, some kind of way of describing how your studio is is so is so unique and how you grew it over time and how what happens here is really just a transition of what happened in your education at the Bartlett. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. So, I mean, as you can see in the studio, we, we're working with all sorts of tools, which are multidisciplinary and need lots of different skills. So, I mean, in the background there, we've got developers, coders, scientists. Um, so <clears throat> over time, we've built up a, I mean, I kind of, I, I think of myself a little bit like a conductor 
and I've got an orchestra and there are people with lots of broad skills, but with deep skills in certain areas. And it might be they can code um, and build environments in Unity. It might be they uh, have specialisms in physical computing um, using embedded controllers. It might be that we've got architects in the team as well. Um, interaction designers, 3D designers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. Um, and it means we can be very fluid and we can work as a team. And if we have ideas, we have people with very different viewpoints and disciplines and specialisms. The team's slowly grown. So at some, I mean, I started working by myself and I was coding, building, sketching, uh, delivering small projects. But as We've grown, we have um, bring on board more and more specialists. Um, I mean, we have people now that are just electronic engineers, just mechanical engineers, design engineers, computational designers, creative technologists. So lots of people that are working on that sort of cusp of creative disciplines and technology. And uh, I suppose a kind of the easy sort of catch all idea of a creative technologist is certainly the sort of people we're hiring but but also obviously i mean architects are, have a lot of the skills we use in the studio i mean the ability to communicate the ability to interrogate the environment but also with technical skills that go right through to coding and drawing so and that's happened over time so yeah there's there's lots of quite unusual skills and i'd say i mean i have a physicist on the team um, I'm thinking at the moment about hiring a horticulturalist because we're looking at lots of projects which have kind of an aspect of greenery and planting in them. Um, so, uh, yeah, exciting times. Thank you. Um, so, Jay, do you want to show another project and then um, maybe I'll throw <coughs> a few more questions towards you? Is that, uh, is that how Let, Let's do that. I mean, what I've been right. showing at you, is a project this this project was um this was in the barbican uh it was inspired by the concrete the bush hammered concrete of the barbican so they had about fifteen thousand laborers create that texture um on the barbican art center in london it's a sort of brutalist building so this very rough texture comes from this sort of mechanical activation and we were given the tunnel as an environment, this, this road tunnel, um, one of the most polluted places in London. I um, mean, diesel buses and all sorts of things running through this tunnel um, with a sort of 1960s, 70s, 80s architecture that can't deal with the amount of fumes and things in there. Um, and they were looking at change of use of this space to become a cultural environment. And so we, suggested these sketches for this sort of living, breathing, animated architecture, um, inspired by that brutalist texture, creating this sort of tapestry <coughs> that uses live data from its environment. I'm going to throw another question at you. Right? We'll just extemporize through this. Um, so first of all, great lecture. Uh, um, though, uh, well, Jeff Day has revealed his name there, suggests that he's going to be doomed to nightmares about pandas from now on. However, he's interested to know how you position your work, um, whether it's autonomous in, and independent, presenting itself to the viewer as a spectacle, or is the work depend, dependent upon the viewing subject? As Brian Eno rejects the term interactive and prefers work that is unfinished, only to be complete in the experience of the individual. Do you seek to create active engagements with your audience or do you choose to maintain a certain distance? Uh, Olaf for Eliasson cited also there's work that might be similar there. Well, lots of good questions and observations there. Um, I mean, I don't believe a lot of my work and the studio's work would be complete without the audience. So the audience may cut part of this discourse, this conversation with the work. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm using quite often um, an analysis of the environment to drive and direct and animate the work and choreograph it. Sometimes it's overt and sometimes it's not. And that kind of varies. And 
and the level of kind of intent the level of um the reading of that work changes quite a bit i mean the work's public so you get used to different sorts of audiences the person that's going to see a piece of work every single day of their life to the one-off intervention the one-off um interaction so you've got many many sub narratives you can build into a work some of which will not get read or understood on day one and some will come more apparent later on so i'd say <clears throat> people might learn how to interact with something over time though but what i also like is narratives that almost get imposed on the work and how people actually invent things around work and people invent interaction as well people are looking for patterns in the world and we're surrounded by a lot of noise digitally acoustically and and we are hardwired to look for patterns so even when there is no interaction people look for it people look for patterns people look for um conversations right i mean I'm, I'm, you know on the back of that um we we have a question from robert twomey that um, I think this one fits more. How do you think that uh, your um, public projects shape behavior in those spaces? And do you think uh, intentionally about the way that they might alter a, a, a typical pattern, typical patterns as he says? Well, I think I'm trying to think of a, project, a good project to- um... Yeah, you you started by sort of answering the question and then I asked the question again, so. <laughs> Just... I think in the work that is um, sort of generated, generating based on movement in space, you do find people altering their behaviours and their routines um, depending on, on the work. So you can create pieces that are create tractors, you can change desire lines, you can change heat maps for spaces by, um, and we're actually working on a piece at the moment, I can't tell you where, next time we meet perhaps i can um yeah. where we have an ai agent interrogating the space looking observing the space and it changes the behavior of the artwork based on whether it thinks it's being looked at and it has um we've got we're working with three different states um, um so the artwork is trying to work out whether it's boring people or making them excited and it changes its behavior and its patterns accordingly so um this is an area which is becoming really interesting and um we're doing sort of more and more work thinking about what, what outcomes we are creating and tailoring the work to the kind of live condition the live status of the site do you um so i i see that the use of the robotic arm is something that's more recent in your work i don't know if that's fair to say <laughs> but the que there's the question which sort of leads in from that is um <laughs> how your light sculptures are explicitly interactive, um, but uh, with the robotic arms, the viewers appear to be a little bit more passive observers. Are you, are you thinking about the robotic in a, arm in a way in the future that can be more explicitly interactive? Uh, that's another question from Robert. The, the robotics are very interesting because as we work on them, <clears throat> the first intervention we created, we were having to, sign off every movement the robot makes so when when an engineer a robotics integrator working in a factory every tool path every movement the robot makes is essentially signed off and tested and rehearsed and version one of our latest series of explorations we had to do that we had to sort of bake in the entire choreography and it was something that was played in a closed loop without any inter interaction um, in Tokyo, I did actually want to push it into the world of creating something that would respond and change and be affected by the environment around it. But we have a piece that's not rehearsed. <clears throat> we have a piece that's um, changing based on new data. And, 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 and every day we've got kind of new outcomes. So we are shifting slowly towards something that is real time that is responding and creating something that's kind of live. And it's certainly, that's all, that's all um, down to the nature of working with these machines. They're one and a half tons. They, the end effect of the, 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 the wrist can move at six meters per second. So 
there's there's a lot of rules around what you can and can't do in Tokyo we had three safety systems we had a laser gate system safe move system um <clears throat> and people with kill switches so it's it's very much um it's it's an emerging field how humans and robots interact and um <clears throat> co-inhabit because they um obviously could be dangerous yeah i mean in that that may lead to another question which is are there is there any evidence at the moment that your work with um the robotic arm is shaping public policies in any way or it's is shaping the kind of the constraints or the conditions or the opportunities that are allowed that are afforded to us through public policy i think um we're probably without i mean anecdotally i think we're probably ex we're expanding what is possible um <clears throat> in terms of um sign off licensing um planning um with respect to these sorts of um machines and technologies in public spaces and we've gone from probably every time we iterate and we're doing first in class r d and testing and um deploying these installations every time we increase the capabilities of what we're doing we we are setting the standard for what we can do next time so yes yes we are but it's obviously quite peculiar to what we're doing um but it's interesting working in japan was really interesting because the the kind of acceptance of that sort of technology that acceptance of that technology being used in leisure being used in the home being used in lots of environments in yorkshire it was quite unusual to see a robot outside the context of a factory and not many people had seen one and and very similar in japan but obviously the the sort of robot in its many different guises is much more ubiquitous and omnipresent so the cultural kind of understanding and, and willing, willingness to sort of interact i think it was a kind of um the, the barrier to entry was lower so um i'm wondering if we're we're at time is there something that you would like to conclude with or maybe <clears> that maybe to is there a project that you'd like to conclude with i have a few more questions i'm happy to to field field those questions, perhaps we we can we can wrap up in the next in the next five minutes if that's okay. No, that's that sounds that sounds really good. I have a I have a project. It's a small project, but it's um it's I suppose I like it um, because um, it's extremely multisensorial. We we um, we design. A lot using um, our eyes, and I'm at, in fact I'm actually working on some. I'm working currently on a, a in, on an eye hospital, thinking about um, how um, we can understand and respond to our world in other ways. And this was a commission from a perfume museum in Paris, um, where they wanted to use create a perfumer's organ, which is this piece of furniture on the right to explain how perfumes are mixed together. And um, I thought it would be really interesting to trace the movement of all the ingredients going together to create these perfumes. And this was for an independent perfume museum in Paris and part of an experience. And um, a gentleman called Frank Gilbreth created these light paintings over a hundred years old on the right here, um, looking at the efficiency of workspaces. So the sort of movements of ingredients and and I thought it'd be wonderful if we can sort of trace these um, ingredients coming together, almost like this sort of light constellation. So came up with a kind of idea of almost like an, an organ made from light bringing these ingredients together. So it's a matrix of white laser. Um, we've got a map of all these ingredients. Um, and I just wanted to think about, I mean, designing across the senses, essentially, the idea of um, translating things from sound into into light and from light into the olfactory um, senses. So this, um, I'll play you. 
this is a sort of perfume coming together and represented by light and sound. So very sort of interested in the idea of synesthesia. So sort of mapping um, light, mapping um, sound onto the idea of scent. And in this project, um, we were able to um, convey the ingredients within this, within these scent constellations to the perfumers we were working with. This is a matrix of white laser bouncing through a network of prisms to sort of create these um, representations of scents being mixed. So just really encouraging people to think about multi-sensorial um, design and thinking across um, different materials. There we go. Well, thank you very much. This is a perfect fade out piece and um, uh, a beautifully sort of atmospheric way to, to end, end, end the lecture. And it's just, um, again, my pleasure just to thank you for everything that, uh, th for joining us and everything that you've shown us. Um, fascinating and, and, you know, and, and really illuminating work that, that continues to pour out of your studio. So um, thank you so much. I would be glad if attendees just signal their appreciation in the chat room it's i know it's a bit of a lonely um, it's a lonely furrow that you're hoeing out there at the top of your garden shed in in london but um again once again thank you we will we will continue this conversation as long as we as long as we have so it's a great pleasure thank you jason well thank you very much everyone delight delighted to um, be presenting to you this afternoon.